We're going to go in our Bibles to John chapter 14 tonight, book of John. Intermittently, I've been doing a series, Key Chapters of the Bible. You wouldn't know it's a series because I haven't done it in any, in any particular order, but uh, we've looked at Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, very important uh, chapters, Exodus 20, Isaiah 53, might remember some of these, Psalm 1, John chapter 3. Uh, tonight we're looking at uh, John 14. Last week we looked at Luke 15, the three, or the one parable of the three lost things. John chapter 14, let me just start by reading uh, part of the first verse. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, Let not your heart be troubled. Now, why would he say that? If you go back just a few verses to chapter 13, verse 33, he's been talking to them. And in verse 33, he says to them, Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. Then in verse 36, uh, Peter says to him, Lord, whither goest thou? Where, where are you going? He said, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterward. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. There are a couple of things there that uh, were upsetting them. One is he said, I'm going away and you, you can't come. They've been with Jesus for three years. And then he says to Peter, you're going to deny me. You know, that would have been upsetting for, for all of them. And that's the context then as we come to John 14. Let me read the first few verses down to verse 6 when he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. When you see those verses in, in their context, it really makes more sense, doesn't it, as to why he's, he's saying those things. And as he speaks to them in John chapter 14, he gives them some of the reasons why he has to leave, but also why, those, why these reasons are a comfort to them. He has to leave, and the first reason is to prepare a place for them. He said, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When, uh, when you think of heaven, when you write heaven, the word heaven, you need to spell it with a capital H. It's a real place. You know, we don't write Brisbane with a lower case B, do we? Capital B, you know, it's a place. And it's the same with heaven. It's a real place. And... Uh, uh, I don't know, it might bring up different pictures to your mind, but he says uh, uh, there, there's many mansions, and I'm preparing a place for you. A big house, I don't know. It's a prepared place for a prepared people. There's some verses in Thessalonians where he encourages us, and uh, he says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Going to be with Jesus is a good thing. <laughs> now, whether it's by death or whether it's by uh, you know, the, the rapture, the Lord taking us out, uh, there's a prepared place for a prepared people. Had he stayed, he would not have gone to prepare a, a place for us. And he lays out for them, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. You know, we're born lost and ignorant and dead spiritually. <laughs> and Jesus is the answer to all of those problems. We're lost, he's the way. Uh, we're ignorant, he's the truth. Uh, we're dead spiritually, well, he's the life. And in Jesus, we have the answer to, to the problems that we face. Uh, let me ask you, is heaven your destination? Why? 
We hear that question a lot in our home right now. Uh, about anything, you know, why? Well, is heaven your destination? Why? How do you know? Uh, that's, that's why Jesus went. And if you're a prepared person, there's a prepared place for you. You know Jesus as your Savior. The second thing he said to them in verses 7 through 11, uh, he went to reveal the Father. Uh, let's read verse 7. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now, Jesus went away to reveal the Father. Now, he, he was revealing the Father. He showed them the Father by his life, of course. Uh, the, you know, he's the perfect image of the Father. He, he's God manifest. But he also had to show the Father by completing the gospel. You know, we wouldn't really have seen uh, the picture that God was creating from the Old Testament right through the New Testament if Jesus didn't finish the work that he came to do. You know, the gospel had to be complete. Uh, the prophecies had to be fulfilled. Uh, he had to show the Father by completing the gospel uh, by his death and, and resurrection. In Colossians chapter 1 and, and verse 26, he talks about the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. You know, there's been things that people haven't really quite understood until Jesus came. And I think there's going to be things, you know, we're, we're looking at Revelation. There's things that we're going to understand when Jesus comes again. We're going to say, that's what he meant. <laughs> that's what that verse is about. You know, there's just things we, we don't always understand until God, God shows them. And the main way we know the Father is by seeing, seeing Jesus. In that same chapter, Colossians 1, it says that Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Later, it says in verse 20, having made peace to the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And then where we read in verse 26, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you see the Son, you see the Father. When you see the Father, you see the Son. He completes the Bible. He completes God's plan. In John 17 and verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, I have... I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, for Jesus to go away, the disciples needed to understand this was him going back to what he, what he truly is. And that shouldn't cause them distress. That should cause them to glory. If you, if you love the Lord, you want, him to be, uh, you want everything to be right for him. Jesus and the Father are one. God makes that statement. And uh, Jesus' completed work really reveals what we uh, read in Isaiah 9 when he talks about, unto us a child is born. And that child is also the mighty God and the everlasting Father. And we see that as Jesus fulfills uh, his destiny and why he came. And as he goes back to the, to the Father. So we see... As Jesus is, is preparing to leave, he goes to prepare a place. He is there, and he is going to reveal the Father. Thirdly, he's, there to, he's going to grant the privilege of prayer. Look at verse 12. Let me read uh, chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
uh, the privilege of prayer. Uh, you, you need to understand as we, as we read these things. Um, we pray in Jesus' name. We don't pray in our, in our own name. Uh, unfortunately, many times we just make that kind of a little verbal add-on. In Jesus' name, amen. But what we're saying is we're praying because we believe this is what Jesus would pray. We're, we're praying because uh, we have his authority. You know, he said to come boldly to the throne of grace and find uh, grace to help in, in time of need. And, and we don't have the right to pray in Jesus' name unless we're trusting him and obeying him, really. Uh, Matthew 21 and verse 22, find that verse. Jesus says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. We need to be believing. You know, it's like the man who, you know, he'd read how if you, you prayed, the mountain would move. and you know, So he prayed, Lord, move that mountain. He got up the next morning, it, wasn't, it was still there. He said, I, th I thought it would be. <laughs> you know, a lot of times we pray, just kind of just throw things out there, you know. Well, maybe the Lord will hear this one. Uh, we have to believe him. And uh, if you want to kind of make your prayer life a little more real, just try sometimes using those words. Instead of saying the words in Jesus' name, say, I'm praying this because I believe this is what Jesus would pray. It'll make you a little more serious about your prayer life. It'll make you a little more personal in, in your prayer life. Uh, don't, don't do it uh, carelessly. But as well, uh, in our prayer life, we, part of a key there is, is that we obey him. In 1 John chapter 3 and, and verse 22, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave his commandment. Uh, to me, that's an amazing verse right there. He, he lays out the whole Christian life in one verse, and it's basically two things. <laughs> believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave his commandment. And he says part of prayer is believing and obeying. I think there's... Well, there's probably many, but I'll give you three keys to prayer tonight. One, they all come from the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. When you pray, ask yourself, will this honor the Lord? Is this something I'm asking because it will honor the Lord? You know, so, so many times our prayer life is selfish. Uh, there in, in John chapter 14 and, and verse 13, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We need to be asking that the Father will be glorified in the Son. Not just to get, make our life easy, not just to glorify us. Hallowed be thy name. Will it honor God? Secondly, uh, he uses the phrase in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Will it hasten his kingdom? Is it part of his work? You know, we don't always know what God is doing. And God, God works in some pretty strange ways, you know. Uh, we think we're supposed to be over here, and he heads us in this direction. You know, uh, It just doesn't always work the way we think it's going to. Will it hasten his kingdom? And then the third one is, he says, thy will be done. Will it agree with Scripture? God is not going to answer prayer in disagreement with his word. Uh, in uh, verse 14 there of chapter 14, if you ask anything in my name, uh, in agreement with him. And one of the things he said there in verse 12 was that greater works... We're going to do greater works than he did. That's a strange statement, isn't it? I think part of that is that Christ's ministry was very limited. It was just a small place. I, I, I should have figured it out, but pretty much like the Brisbane area that he was in. Um, but as the Holy Spirit came and, and prayer and, and all these things began to, uh, to happen, man, the message went out to the world. People went all over the world for, for Christ. And... Uh, it was a greater ministry than Jesus had in that sense. Uh, Jesus went away to grant us the privilege of prayer. And listen, prayer is a privilege. You ever woken up in the middle of the night and just talked to the Lord? Boy, I do. <laughs> uh, sometimes I wake up and, uh, I don't know, just feeling anxious. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just take it to the Lord in prayer. 
And uh, I've got some scriptures I go through. I rarely finish them. <laughs> I have an alphabet that some of you learned it with, from Proverbs, and I start through that. I usually get to about M. <laughs> and uh, you know, off, off I go. It, it helps. To, we, we have that contact with our Lord anytime, any place. The fourth thing there in verses 15 and following, Jesus went away to send the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also." At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Just stop reading there. He goes away to send the Holy Spirit. Uh, do you notice in verse 16, he says, I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter. Uh, another comforter. Uh, we're familiar with that word, uh, paraclete, you know, it's just of the Holy Spirit, one who comes alongside and, and helps us. Uh, and the word another means another of the same kind. He's not just sending any old spirit, he's sending God's spirit. Uh, we only believe in one God. And he's saying, I'm going to be with you. In verse 18, it is an interesting um, word here. I'll not leave you comfortless. That's a different word than the one in verse 16. It's the word orphanos. You ever heard a word like that? He said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. He's not going to leave you alone. You're not going to be on your own. And uh, when uh, Judas, not Iscariot, asks, how can you be with us and not with them? Well, he, he's basically saying, you're going to have the Holy Spirit. He's going to be in you and with you. Uh, he's going to send them a comforter. It's interesting how the first part of the chapter basically talks about believers going to be with God. Then he talks about God coming to be with believers. <laughs> he's not going to leave us alone. He's not going to make us leave us orphans. Uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, through his word, uh, he would be their comforter. He would also be their teacher. Did you notice that in verse 26? The Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance uh, whatsoever I'd, I've said unto you. Uh, later in chapter 16, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. God's Holy Spirit. He goes away, he says, I, I'm going to send the comforter. I'm not going to leave you alone. Um, fourthly, verses 27 to the end, he goes away to grant his peace. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. That's what I was mentioning earlier. You know, the fact that Jesus is going back to his, his glory, we should rejoice in that. You know, he's he's going to be back where, he's, where he should be. And now I have told you before it came to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. He talks about granting his, his peace. And a part of that is that he has to finish 
the work that God has given him to do. He's going to die for the, our sins. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise again. He's going to go back to heaven, be at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Uh, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. You know, all of that has to do with, with our peace. And this is not the world's temporary, shallow peace. A good illustration of that is in the news uh, between Turkey and Syria. <laughs> now, if that's the kind of peace you want, don't worry about the Lord, all right? Uh, but if you want the Lord's peace, uh, it, no matter what's going on around you, you can have that peace. And that's an amazing thing. Um, you see this in many homes. Uh, parents sometimes opt for a false peace when they don't discipline their children. Yeah, and they say, oh, well, just, oh, it's okay. And they, they work it out, you know, without any discipline. And the problem is, as time goes by, they get less and less peace. They're less and less able to work it out until the children finally leave. And then mom and dad breathe a sigh of relief, and then the troubles continue from there. Um, see, that's not the kind of peace Jesus is offering. He's not saying, I'll, I'll, I'll sort out a bargain for you. He's talking about the peace that passes understanding. You read it there in uh, Philippians chapter 4. You know, he, he helps your mind to know what to think about. He helps you to have the, the, the peace that passes understanding. And that comes from, uh, from God. God's peace required Christ's death. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because Jesus defeated Satan by the gospel. He, he's talking about Satan when he says, um, the prince of this world cometh. <laughs> uh, Getting ready for a, for a battle here. The prince of this world's coming. That's, the, that's Satan he's talking about. And he defeated Satan by the gospel. Jesus willingly lowered himself, made himself of no reputation, the Bible says in Philippians. And his going back to his glory is all a part of this comfort that we have as Jesus is talking to the disciples about going away. Listen, Christ didn't take the easy way. He took the permanent way. That's why we are offered eternal life. Eternal life. And what a blessing it is that we can rejoice in the Lord and have that, that hope and that peace because He gives us eternal life. Now these things that He's talked about, do you see the comfort of an eternal place? If you've ever been misplaced, <laughs> some of you have, you know, we, we, a lot of us come from lots of different places. And it, it's hard when you, don't, when you think, oh, I have no place. Well, we have an eternal place in heaven. Uh, can you see the comfort of, of an eternal father? I mean, think about the relationships we have. We cannot guarantee our human relationships. Listen, I can't tell my children I'll always be there for them. I won't always be there for them. I can't say that to my wife. My wife can't say that to me. You know, today could be our, our last day on earth. We don't know about our human relationships, but we can know about our heavenly father. You know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, that's the kind of peace we're talking about. You see the comfort of eternal access? Case in point, mobile phones. <laughs> pastor, I'm sick. Oh, I can't get a hold of the pastor. <laughs> yeah, uh, the times when you really need them, they don't work or whatever. Listen, we have permanent access to our Heavenly Father. Don't have to clear it with anybody. We don't have to be on internet. <laughs> they never get out of range. Can you see the comfort of an eternal comforter and teacher? I mean, all the time he's there. The Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. Uh, I think our relationship to God through the Holy Spirit is one that's greatly undervalued. Yet as we go through the things of life, and God tells us he's got grace available. His Holy Spirit is there. All, all these things that we have from the Lord. A permanent comforter and teacher. Can you see the, the comfort of an eternal peace? Now, quite often we don't claim that. And uh, oftentimes we, we opt for the, the physical side of things rather than the spiritual side. But all of this hinges on Christ's finished work. And as Christ is talking to them, saying, I've got to go away. You can't come now. And, and by the way, Peter... You're going you're gonna to deny me. Well, you can, can you just see the startling feeling that would have given to those men? Here's, here's their leader, Peter, you, you know, after Christ. Peter, by the way, you're, you're going to deny me. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Folks, we, we'll fail the Lord. We have. We will in the future. But that's not the, the key to our relationship. It's not our character. It's his character. And as he talks to them, he gives them, them hope. He gives them comfort. It all hinges on his finished work. There's comfort. Uh, there's hope in Christ. Do you know him? Do you know him today? Let's go to him in, in prayer this evening. Father, we are grateful that you know us. And uh, Lord, I pray if there are heartaches, uh, Lord, that we would bring them to you. And we're thankful that you care and know. and Lord, that you have peace for us, that, you have, that we have access to you. And we thank you for all these things. Help us to know your comfort. Help us to know your hope. Father, I pray if there are any that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to see that, that they would repent and believe tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.